I don't know if I'll ever be used to that. <laughs> it's going to be different today. Happy Mother's Day! It is a wonderful day in which we give honor to our mothers and that um, we're grateful for our visitors that we have here today. We're grateful to see the Ludies back from Florida and that Larry is doing well. I am I'm hope that you're in full recovery and if you're not, well, I hope that you're close to it. It is, is the day that we come to give thanks and praise to God, but it's also the day to listen to the challenges that God lays upon us as to how we can continue to live as his disciples. And so I pray that today's worship service will be one that you indeed will experience God's presence and that you'll feel connected to each other, feel connected to the calling that God has given to you as individuals and for this congregation. I'd like to welcome those who are watching us on Facebook and YouTube. We want you to know that we are glad that you are following us through worship service but we hold, also hope that, that if you have any inclination, if you feel the Spirit nudging you to come to any of our advanced ministries and anything else that's happening here at First Christian Church. This Wednesday, we're going to have our health and well-being uh, service, which is at 630, which will be at the John Walker Chapel. Also, a week from today, we'll be the church board meeting after worship service. And then two weeks from today, it's going to be Pentecost Sunday. It's a day that we are celebrating when the birth of the church as we know it began. Also, on June 5th, uh, we're going to have another prayer vigil. We're going to have many prayer vigils because it's important for us to be spending time praying as to the sort of direction that God wants us to go as a church. And that we'll be just praying that we'll be uh, fill, more filled with the Spirit than we have ever have been as a congregation on June 5th. And on June 6th, uh, we will be having our launching into the future meeting. Also, I'd like to encourage anyone after worship service today uh, that if you just have a few moments uh, to help bring up chairs uh, for tomorrow night's Kix Bands concert. So tomorrow night's the Kix Bands concert, which it's going to be at 7 o'clock. And so uh, if you can bring your lawn chairs, but if you can't bring your lawn chair, uh, we will have uh, chairs available. Also, want to give thanks uh, to Alice uh, to Kathy Walker, to Linda Williams, uh, to uh, Leanne and David uh, and, and Sharon uh, for the lilies. Don't that just look awesome? I sorry. Yes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. But, but I'll have somebody in the back who will be giving me a bad time after worship service. So let us now have our prelude.
Thank you, Christopher. That was fabulous. Well, welcome to all our mothers today and all of the people that have acted like mothers, even if you have not had children, many of us, and we all know all those, those mothers. And then I also want to, to acknowledge all of our mothers in heaven. We all have a mother, many of us have mothers that are already in heaven, and it's really important to think about that on this very special day. First of all, I want to read the best Bible verses in the Bible, the Proverbs 31 verses about the woman. It's the, the wife of a noble character. A wife of a noble character, who, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it out of her earnings. She, planted, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes a covering for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. And I also want to just bring, uh, to make special note of some of our recent uh, Proverbs 31 women who have left us, uh, including Gisela Weber, Doris Dolphus, Twyla Williams, Margaret Stevens, Lee Edens, Dorothy Secrets, and Frances Haynes. And like I said before, all the women that have that we know are in heaven and all the mothers that we loved so much. And like I was telling them at the nursing home this morning, I said there were many times that my mother and I did not see eye to eye. But every day that she's, that as I get older, I find out how wise she really was. And then for all of us, there are people that we have uh, that we know are like our bonus mothers. But they don't have to be our mother of, of birth or anything like that. We have bonus mothers, and, and two of my favorite bonus mothers are Lorene Shannon and Jane Hanks, who's back in, in the church today. So thank you to all of these wonderful women, and all of you women that are here today. I know that love is in your hearts, and you are wonderful mothers, even if you did not bear a child, but you've been mother to many, many people. Let us pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to gather today on this very special day, the May day that we honor our mothers and that we can love them in our hearts and know that they are the reason that we are strong today. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are in our presence today to be with us as we share this wonderful worship service and praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing about the faith of our mothers.
One of the things I forgot to mention in announcements is that during communion time, after you take communion, uh, that you see we have white and red carnations, not lilies. And that uh, if your mother, hopefully I'm telling this right, correct me if I'm wrong, but if that your mother's passed away, uh, to pick up the white carnation, if your mother's still alive, to pick up the red carnation. Did I say that right? So in terms of concerns and joys, uh, the first one to share with you is that Jim Mathis at the nursing home has been in the hospital all week. Uh, they think that he'll be back at the nursing home tomorrow. And then the second prayer uh, request is that to thank God uh, for all the uh, good Christian mothers and indeed um, I think this is a very special day for all of us because it uh, causes us to think a lot about our own mothers and, and what they really mean to us. Do want to also mention a prayer of thanks uh, that Lauren had uh, some health concerns earlier this week and now he's back and boy he looks good doesn't he? And also again we're just grateful uh, that Larry is, you know, uh, doing much better and that he's here in worship with us and that he's hopefully passed the worst of his health uh, issues that he's been dealing with. Uh, also, be sure to keep uh, Dwayne Dewey in your thoughts and prayers. They ask right now that there's no visitors, but let's just be sure to keep uh, not only Dwayne, but also Mary in our thoughts and prayers. Let us now have a few moments of silent prayer. Loving God, as I just said a few moments ago, Mother's Day causes us to think about our mothers. And certainly I think about my own mom. I think about how she has meant so much to me and my siblings. But that in some ways that she was also sort of like a surrogate mother to some other people, or as, uh, as what Carol said a moment ago, she was like a, a, um, a second mom. And that, dear God, we are grateful for the ways that our moms have touched our lives. And I just, dear God, know that we, are, we just give you thanks for the moms that have really touched our lives and tr truly brought your goodness into our lives, who definitely reflect what we heard today from Carol's reading from Proverbs 31. But I also think, dear God, it's important to remember our moms right now, how important it is, dear God, for us 
to give them support because I know that I, we, as, as, as a male, and then to top it off as a person who's never had a child, I have no clue how difficult it is to be a mother. But it is. And that they deserve our support. Not any sort of uh, negative judgment. And so I pray, dear God, for our mothers today to give them any support that we possibly can. But I also pray, dear God, for those whose mothers were less than stellar. They had created all kinds of difficulties. I think it's important on this day that not everybody, dear God, is going to have warm, fuzzy feelings like I do about my mom. That there are those, dear God, whose moms created trauma, created disappointment. And we pray, dear God, for their children, as well as for the moms if they're still alive. But we just pray for the children as they work through their emotions of having to deal with such a mom. So, dear God, as I and praying this prayer that we see there's many layers when we talk about our moms, that yes, we do want to give thanks and praise, dear God, for those who are fantastic and wonderful mothers, which would be the overwhelming majority of women. But it's also important just to restate that we need to be there for all women who are mothering, that any way that we can be of support to them, I pray we'll be there. And I pray, dear God, for your healing upon those who have been wounded by their moms. Help us, dear God, live by the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, in heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will, will be, done be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. bread. And forgive those sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. reading comes from Luke 7, 1 to 10. This is about the faith of the centurion. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders to the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation 
and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That's why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. And he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Thank you for the reading, Carol. So in today's Bible lesson, Jesus enters the town of Capernaum. And in this town, there's a centurion, a Roman military commander who has a servant that's seriously ill, that's near death. And he sends his Jewish friends requesting for Jesus to heal his servant. There are Jewish elders pleading with Jesus to heal the serpent because this centurion has been good to the people and comparing them that he has built them a synagogue, their house of worship, and that he loves the people. Now, because I think many of us have heard this story so many times, we need to stop here for a moment before I go any further into this story. It cannot be overemphasized how astounding it was that a centurion would seek out Jesus to heal his servant. It's equally remarkable that we have Jewish elders speaking on behalf of the centurion because he had been kind enough to build them a temple and to help and to be friends. It would have been extremely unusual for a centurion or for any other Roman soldier to have a positive relationship with the Jews. They are the, uh, they are the dominant force. They are occupying Israel. Their job is to make sure that there is law and order. Most of the Roman occupiers would have disliked the Jews and would have been fiercely loyal to Rome. They would have brought their own Roman gods and believed that the Roman gods were superior to the God of Israel. And many of the Roman occupiers would have been psychologically and physically violent towards the Jews and that the, that the Jews would have had no recourse to deal with any of the injustice that would have been inflicted upon them. So let's not look upon this story as a happy, slappy kind of story because it's really a quite remarkable, and as I'll say in a few moments, a subversive story. Jesus agrees to help. He and others head towards the centurion's house. And before they arrive at the house, the group was gr greeted by the centurion's friends. And they convey on behalf of the cent centurion a breathtaking message. They tell Jesus that the military commander does not feel that he is worthy to be in the presence of Jesus. But say the word to cure my servant. Even more amazing, he believed that Jesus could heal his servant from a distance, that, that Jesus did not have to be physically present to heal his servant. 
His friends tell us how the centurion gives an order and that his troops will follow those orders. They know better than not to follow those orders. This soldier grasped Jesus' compassion, uniqueness, and power. And this is, I think, an important point that I never thought about until preparing for the sermon is that the centurion was at the mercy of Jesus. He was at the mercy of Jesus. This is what I mean by being subversive. Subversive means things have been turned around. Things have been turned around upside down, that you have this powerful Roman military officer that is begging Jesus for help. And that more so, he's not depending upon his Roman gods. He says, you know what, you don't even have to come here because I know that I've done things that I'm not proud of. But I believe that you have the sort of compassion from a distance to heal my servant. When Jesus heard the commander's friend's message, he was blown away. He says, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. It gets more subversive. This was no subtle criticism of the Israelites' faith in God. It had to sting and offend his Jewish audience in saying that the Roman occupier had more faith and belief than they did. The friend returns to the house to find that the servant is well. The key point is that the centurion believed in Jesus' ability to heal others. And because of the commander's belief in what Jesus could do, he took action to seek him out to heal his servant. What drives our action or inaction, what we do or do not do, is what we believe in. We read over and over again of how people believed in Jesus and took action to find relief and healing. Just give you three quick examples. In Matthew and Mark, you have the story of the Phoenician woman. I love saying that word, Phoenician. That's one of the few long words that I can actually say. Normally, I butcher long words like that. But that's the Phoenician woman who's a Gentile, who's not a Jew, seeks out Jesus because her daughter is demon-possessed and that she asks for Jesus to exorcise her daughter of the demons in which he does just that. In Mark, some people brought a blind man to Jesus with, again, the belief that he could restore the man's eyesight, and indeed, Jesus restored the man's eyesight. And then in Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26, we have the story of how there's a man who is paralyzed. His friends find out that Jesus is coming to their village. And so they put him on a stretcher. They take him to the house where Jesus is at, but the house is filled to the brim with people. Now they can't get in to have Jesus restore the man's ability to move. But they did not give up. They did not give up because they had belief in Jesus. And so what happened is then they lifted the uh, paralytic man up to the roof. They tore out part of the roof and then lift him down to where Jesus is at. And just like he was with the centurion, he was blown away by their faith. And he restored the man's ability to move. I share these biblical stories of believing for us as Jesus' disciples and for First Christian Church. I shared these stories of belief as 
we are in launching into the future. What do we believe? Yes, on a personal level, we believe that Jesus Christ is our personal Lord and Savior and the Son of God. But what does that look like in our lives in church? That cannot be just a mere doctrine. That cannot just be a mere statement. It has to be a belief. Last Wednesday, we had our Launching Into the Future meeting. It was different from the other Launching Into the Future meetings. That instead of talking about what direction God is leading us uh, forward as a church, the question that was asked is, when did Jesus first become real to you? Then people were given 10 minutes uh, to be in silence to write down when Jesus was first real to them. We broke, there were 13 people there. We broke into three groups. And folks, it was amazing. It was amazing to hear the stories of how Jesus became real to them, how Jesus remains real to them at this very moment. It brought about spiritual energy, or in other words, it, it brought about the uh, awareness of the Holy Spirit. I suspect most, if not all of us, have a belief that Christ is real and present, active in the world, and will continue blessing and forgiving us in surprising ways. What do you believe about First Christian Church? Do you believe that we're in the final stretches of congregation and there's nothing that we can do to reverse the trend? Or do you believe that God is not done with First Christian Church and will empower and guide our congregation to a new kind of ministry? It matters what we believe in in answering these two questions. I believe that God has a purpose and mission for every Christian in church right now. Right now. Now, there will be times when we are uncertain as to whether we can continue on or what we're even supposed to do. And that's why we have launching into the future. I have no qualms. And I can't say that was always true since being here, but I have no qualms now in believing amazing things God will do at First Christian Church. Now, it's, it's already happening, but I believe it's going to continue increasing here at this church. Now, I know, and I ask you to bear with me as to why I'm going to repeat some stories, but I'm going to put, uh, but, but add a little bit of an extra layer to these stories because the reason I'm sharing these stories was about my unbelief that I had about this church. Now, many of you are aware that I've been dealing with chronic pain since 2019. Gone through, you know, different doctors and MRIs and CAT scans, and they said, there's nothing wrong with me physically. But they kept on treating me physically. And it wasn't until I came here that my Leavenworth doctor sent me to the Lemon Center for pain rehab. And it turns out that a big chunk of the reason for my chronic pain is that it's stress-related, psychologically related, however you want to say it. And so that what was, what's been beautiful is that I've been doing meditations, which fortunately, Dr. Lemons is a man of faith. And I shared that this is just a form of prayer. And it's helped me begin to realize the things that I've been anxious about, stressed out about, that I shouldn't be. And that point was driven home come September. That after I started seeing Dr. Lemons in July or August, and that I then went, I went up to Iowa to, to see some family. And I saw my sister, and I was telling my sister, you know, what a wonderful uh, ministry that this church had. These people are fantastic. I went on about this. And then I went into what could go wrong. 
I went into what, what could go wrong here. And it confused my sister. And we had the sort of relationship that we don't hold back. And she was telling me, like, what is your problem here? You're telling me that this is a wonderful group of people, that there's a strong ministry to build upon. And she was right. But then what's the funny part is then two days later, I saw my brother-in-law, David, and I went through the same routine. Why a wonderful group of people. There's a fantastic ministry here at First Christian Church. Oh, by the way, this is what could go wrong. And that my brother-in-law is even more blunt than my sister. And it's like, what is your problem, dude? Now, he doesn't use the word dude. I was letting unbelief get in the way. And that was certainly part of the reason I now realize is that what was causing the chronic pain. I was self-sabotaging. I was doing it to myself. I want to be clear, it wasn't you folks. And what has been beautiful since that time, those, uh, uh, that's a turning point for me. For since that time, in having this unqualified belief of what God can do here in this church is that it's been much more fun knowing of what the possibilities are in this church because of what Christ can do. Today, I'm the centurion. I believe and have placed my faith to pour my heart, soul, and mind towards working with God in all of you to become a place where people feel welcome, accepted for who they are, and a safe place for folks to express their thoughts, feelings, questions, and doubts. We want to see a better world. I hear this constantly in people's conversations, not just only in this church, but wherever a person goes. And we can do something about it now by believing that God will help us discover how to share Christ's love, help people know Jesus, work together, serve others, and reach the world. And, of course, what I just now shared with you is First Christian Church's purpose and mission. What I'd like for you to do, if you don't have this memorized that we are to share, our purpose is to share Christ's love, and that we're to help people know who Jesus is, and that we are to work together to serve others to reach the world. If you don't have that memorized, that's okay. Don't worry about it. What you can do is take your bulletin home. And I encourage you, during your devotion time, prayer time, meditation time, whatever you call this time that you spend with God, to pray over the purpose and mission that God has given this church and to believe that there is something bigger and more amazing than what we could ever imagine as a congregation. Be open each day with childlike wonder of how our belief will drive us to a deeper faith in taking action for First Christian's new chapter. A faith that will radiate Christ's love and grace. Let us now bow our heads for a word of prayer. Loving God, there are times that we all fall into unbelief. And when we reach that moment of unbelief, we know, dear God, that creates inaction. Or we take the wrong kind of action. And so I pray, dear God, for us, that if we're not there yet, that's okay. But I pray, dear God, that we will all have this unshakable, this fun-filled, this joyous belief as to how that you are not done with this and that we are going to become a new kind of church, 
a new kind of church, not for our self-satisfaction, but so that we can be able to reach out to Bonner Springs, the surrounding area, and the world, so that more people will come to live in your kingdom. This we pray in your name. Amen.
Let everyone give according to what is in their heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. Dear Lord, accept these offerings from your people, and that whatever cause they are devoted for will prosper under your guidance. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing. God, please prepare us and align us for a fresh moment of the Holy Spirit, whatever it takes. Please have your absolute way in us. We pray expectantly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 